Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNET TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, November 16th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Mark Levine, who is probably about the most well-known and recognized person in Vermont at this point, uh, after the past seven or eight months of uh, seeing him two or three times a week on the governor's press conferences, uh, dealing with the pandemic and coronavirus. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, Dr. Levine is Vermont's health commissioner. He was a, he's been holding on that job since March of 2017. And before that, he was a professor of medicine at the University of Vermont, associate dean for graduate medical education and designated institutional official at the College of Medicine and the UVM Medical Center. Dr. Levine, uh, thank you so much for making the time out of what I know is an incredibly busy schedule to uh, talk with us about uh, where things stand today um, with the uh, pandemic and uh, COVID-19 virus. And I guess uh, just to get us started, um, you know, it seems like uh, after things had sort of, uh, shall we say, stabilized uh, to some degree over the over the summer and the early part of the fall, we're back uh, seeing spikes and outbreaks and uh, upticks in numbers, both here in Vermont and across the nation as well. I, I guess what explains that? Why is it that we are going through this sort of roller coaster of, uh, uh, you know, first an initial outbreak back in the spring in March and April, and again somewhat in the summer, and now for a third time? Yeah, so I think there's a confluence of reasons. Um, and I can't say one more than the other. They all fit together. First of all, Vermont achieved a remarkable degree of virus suppression, more so than anywhere else in the country based on our statistics. Um, the whole country has been having a resurgence, and especially in the uh, Midwest and Plain states, moving eastward. The Northeast region, which, which had been relatively protected in the last number of months, uh, has been having increased activity. Vermont has been, if you will, almost an island in the middle of all that increased activity. Very challenging position to be in. With the advent of fall and winter weather and people moving activities more indoors, with travel continuing to be a major factor uh, and perhaps lack of adherence of visitors to the quarantine policies that we have, and even Vermonters leaving the state and coming back, perhaps some lack of adherence to quarantine policies. And then on top of that, um, abundant mass gatherings, if you will. Multiple households getting together, groups of people, not necessarily with huge events, doesn't have to be a large number, but a number of people in the single digits or teens or 20s, um, all getting together, um, perhaps because of pandemic fatigue or other factors, dropping their guard a little bit and not really adhering to the six foot spacing, to the masking and the avoidance of a crowded situation. And all of that really is uh, encouraged even further when those mass gatherings surround food and drink, which are the times when of course people are not gonna have a mask on. So all of that together, I think, uh, explains things quite well. And how does this period uh, or moment compare to the early days of the pandemic back in March and April when uh, it was first becoming, you know, a serious problem? Um, are we kind of back to square one with this or have we learned stuff about the virus that makes uh, managing uh, this second or third wave uh, more doable? I do think we are getting back to square one in some ways, but things are much different this time around than previously. Previously, we had no PPE, which threatened a lot of people. We had no ability to even perform a test, never mind react to it. So we couldn't accomplish what I call containment, where you test, you isolate the positives, you do contact tracing around those positives, and then you quarantine those who've had sufficient levels of contact. We could do none of that back in March and April. We can do all of that today, which is really, really important. We have the ability to um, expand 
uh, which we are doing testing even further than our most robust testing that we've already been doing. And we have the ability to contact trace around those positive cases. So a containment strategy is no longer out of the question, it's a core part of the strategy. And that's very, very important. We also have PPE, which is important for our healthcare system uh, to survive and be protected as well. A lot of people are talking about the kinds of changes some states are making now as dimming the light switch instead of just flipping it on or off. And I do agree with that to some degree. Um, we don't have to be as uh, strict as those lockdown situations were early on because we do have so many other abilities and so much else going in our favor. Having said that though, I don't wanna minimize the seriousness of what's going on. This is quite serious. This is a nationwide uh, tragedy that's unfolding. And our goal in Vermont is to spare Vermont from as much of the tragedy as possible and be able to return our citizens back to a life that they've been looking forward to and get to that finish line when we'll have vaccines available so that we uh, will be in as good shape as we can be at that point in time. So then it sounds like what you're saying is, uh, is a lockdown is kind of uh, a last resort if nothing yes. else works uh, until a vaccine is generally available. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask one last thing before we turn to that question around the vaccines, because we had some news this morning that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies has also completed some tests that uh, look fairly promising in addition to the ones yeah. that were announced uh, somewhat earlier this month. But um, will there be ample uh, testing supplies and, and will the state be vigorously pursuing uh, getting people tested as much as possible? Yes. Yeah, so st supplies are not a problem right now. If you know about testing, you know you have to have collection supplies to get a sample from a person, and then you need to have all of the laboratory reagents and the laboratory machine platforms to do the assay to get a result. Uh, we're really in good shape with both right now in Vermont, and we've actually done some stockpiling ahead of time to make sure we didn't lose out on anything. Having said that, though, we've also contracted with CIC in, in Boston, who work with the Broad Institute and are developing an entire new pathway of testing to augment what we're doing right now. And that pathway will provide more of what I would call on-demand testing, seven days a week, so that a Vermonter would be able to have more access to a testing facility and hopefully get a rapid result from that as well. So we're continuing to make testing a high priority. The New York Times ranks all the state, states in terms of how they're doing with testing and Vermont has come out number one. Um, some of that's inflated because we're doing abundant college student testing, but I dare say even when the college students leave, we will still have uh, abundant tests per capita compared to most other states. So uh, I was saying a moment ago about uh, about vaccines, and, and uh, I think it's Moderna is a pharmaceutical company that announced today that they had yeah. very promising results, 94% effectiveness. And earlier this month, uh, Pfizer also announced uh, very promising results. Is a vaccine going to be the only way out? I mean, is that essentially the, the off-ramp to all of this? I really do think so. I, I always talk about the two parallel pathways. Whenever a vaccine gets available, it's never going to be the whole population gets it in one fell swoop. So it's going to be many, many months that will go by. So all of us have to adhere to the same kind of things we adhere to every day with the physical distancing, the masking, the avoidance of crowds, the personal hygiene issues. None of that can go away. The vaccines very gradually will come into our state. Hopefully there'll be even more companies on top of Pfizer and Moderna that say we have wonderful results. But keep in mind, these early results haven't had a lot of scientific scrutiny yet. We don't know the safety profile. We need to learn a lot more. But I am very, very encouraged by hearing numbers in the 90 to 94% range for the efficacy of the drug. That's uh, incredible. So. The problem, of course, is if those really are going to be the ones that um, 
are successful in their trials, manufacturing has to be ramped up substantially. Because not only is every state not wanting to have to fight with each other as the United States of America, but our country has to fight with other countries. Um, and this is a worldwide pandemic. So we have to make sure that we have a, a vaccine distribution uh, protocol in the United States that again filters down to the states that's fair and equitable for everyone, but prioritizes the more vulnerable populations or the populations that are at highest risk or have highest need right off the top of the bat. So that's gonna take time. And that's why we figure by the end of this calendar year, we would love to see 20 to 30 or 40,000 doses of vaccine coming into the state. But think about it, we have 600,000 people in the state. So over those next months in 2021, the hope is we'll have enough vaccine coming in at a rapid enough clip that we'll be able to get the population vaccinated. And what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated for it to be effective? I mean, is it 100% or could yeah, it's it probably not? A, yeah, it's probably in the 60, 70% range, but that's an estimate based on science and not necessarily proof with this particular virus. All we know for now is the percent of our population that actually has had contact with the virus is not as high as people would think. It's unfortunately growing in this latest uh, episode of the virus, but the fact is, before this episode, it was well under 5% of Vermonters. And even if it grows two or three times that amount in, the, in this uh, month of November, the fact of the matter is, there's still a lot of people that have not been exposed and would be vulnerable. So nowhere near herd immunity by any means. Mm. Um. And I, I guess I was just wondering, uh, does the state have a plan in place for distributing that vaccine when it does become widely available? Yes. We've, been, we've had a vaccine task force in play for several months now. It's now being augmented by an implementation advisory board that's within and outside of state government. So it has all kinds of sectors and business, things of that sort, other types of uh, physicians involved because um, they have to really help advise us on some of those difficult equity issues and fairness issues and uh, make sure that um, when we develop a prioritization scheme, it actually makes sense to everybody and it's very understandable and uh, fair. So that's a challenge. They'll also have some advice from a national body called the ASIP which is the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices, which advises the CDC, with whom we're working very, very closely because they're responsible for working on the vaccine distribution. So uh, even once the vaccine is uh, widely available, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, we'll still need to wear face masks and practice social distancing and wash our hands a lot uh, for several months into 2021. Definitely. Um, well, how do face masks work? What, uh, what is the efficacy uh, behind it? I, I mean, I think I have a general understanding, but I'm just curious. I, I've been reading recently that uh, in addition to uh, protecting other people from yourself when you may have the virus and not know it, you're also, there's also some uh, evidence emerging that it also protects the wearer as well. Uh, how, exactly. how, does, how do they work to kind of make things not as better than they would be otherwise? Yeah, so a, a cloth face covering is just a meshwork of fibers crisscrossing one another. The kind of uh, masks that are like the surgical masks um, uh, do that to a greater degree. And then the so-called N95s, which are used in the healthcare facilities, um, are, are even tightly, more tightly woven, if you will, so that they prevent the filtration of smaller and smaller size particles. So the reason the N95 is called an N95 is it's filtering 95% of those particles. The two aspects of facial masks that are now much more clear than they were early in the pandemic, but unfortunately, even though they're much more clear, there's still plenty of controversy, 
and people not wanting to buy into the belief system. But all along, we felt that large respiratory droplets that people would cough or sneeze or just yell out uh, would linger in the air for very short periods of time because they're large droplets, they're heavy, they fall with gravity. It's felt that our ability to infect somebody else by expelling these droplets is markedly reduced by having a mask on. Everyone still believes that. The only new belief that I'd like people to accept is that not only are the dress droplets we are accountable for infection, but finer droplets in aerosols are also accountable for a smaller percentage of infection. You would want a mask to be able to filter most of those because those are not gonna drop to the ground quickly. They're gonna linger in a room, especially if you're indoors and not outdoors. So you'd want those to be filtered out by the facial covering the person is wearing. And the most recent data says that not only does it protect everyone else that you're wearing a mask, but you'll actually help yourself not be able to get those fine particles inhaled and infect you. This was wondering from a, from a public health standpoint, uh, what do you see as the big lessons learned from this whole experience? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure at some point down the road, there'll be another Ebola outbreak or a Zika virus or something will happen and we'll, we'll go back through this journey again, uh, hopefully not as severely as we're doing this year, but what, uh, what are your big takeaways from how we could prevent this from being you know, replicated again at some point in the future? Yeah, so, you know, this virus is a formidable foe. So taking it seriously from day one, actually from a month or two before day one, is critical and was critical to our success early on. Recognizing that there's community spread occurring very quickly, uh, recognizing how much you need to have that testing, isolation, contact tracing, quarantine system in place if you're gonna treat an infectious agent like a virus. Uh, so having all of the uh, testing materials, contact tracing staff, et cetera, in place to be able to do that. Having a supply nationally of personal protective equipment, a real stockpile, not something like what we had before where people were shuddering because they were wondering if they could actually deliver medical care because they didn't have the right material. Um, other lessons learned are uh, definitely that you need a governor who prioritizes health and safety, takes that as his prime responsibility for the electorate and for his citizens, and really will be willing to work with the health community, if you will, to implement necessary strategies. Um, other important lessons learned, protecting the most vulnerable. We took that on very early, making sure our hospital hospitals were protected and our long-term care facilities, our nursing homes, making sure that um, we uh, use the public health science, use the data, make sure that we understand that close contact, being in a room with a lot of people, being in a room for a long time with a lot of people are not things that we should be advising and that we should actually be making sure people understand that very clearly having trusted messengers deliver messages so that people can evaluate them and, and understand where they're coming from. Knowing that being a rural state is not protective in a pandemic like this. The latest phases of the illness across the country have been in much more rural settings and suburban settings than they are, were in urban settings. Um, and we've learned containment works. We just have to be able to practice it We've learned that um, there are health equity issues, that some of our uh, newer populations in Vermont needed to have more interpretive materials available to them, needed to understand how to do all those things that we tell people to do every day uh, in language they could understand and in a culturally sensitive and competent way. And we've learned that you can balance how to reopen a state and the economy with the public health risks on the other side, and you can actually do both. It's not one or the other. 
you can actually do both. Um, there's probably a million other things we've learned, but I think I've given you a pretty good list to start with. Indeed. Um, and one final question, because I know our time is limited here. Uh, what's, your, what's your advice for folks in Vermont uh, as the holiday season arrives, Thanksgiving, Christmas? Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, we need to kind of restructure how we would normally practice Thanksgiving instead of having everybody in the family over for turkey. Uh, I want to scale it back a little bit. Uh, but what are, what, are, what are some of the rules you would like uh, Vermonters to be mindful of as we, as we enter this holiday period? Sure. So as we said at the beginning of this uh, conversation, these kinds of gatherings are what got us to where we are now. Uh, so we have to learn our lessons from that. I also can't say anything today that isn't consonant with the governor's new executive order and emergency orders about gatherings and the fact that households are fine, multiple households are not fine, and sometimes multi-generational households are not fine if you're all coming from a different place to gather together uh, because you need to protect those who are in the higher generations uh, from those who are younger and don't realize they might be uh, asymptomatically capable of transmitting the virus. So, uh, you know, I've, I think we've done an effective job in Vermont of saying that Thanksgiving needs to be different this year than it has been before, with the hopes that maybe the holidays at the end of the year won't have to be so different. I think we tried to message that in Halloween and unfortunately, Halloween, though the kids had a great time and the trick-or-treating went very well and was done according to public health guidance, we know of abundant parties that unfortunately occurred that were prime spreading events for um, you know, this virus. Not that that's the only reason we're in the situation we're at, but it's a holiday and that's why I'm bringing it up. Thanksgiving is similar. And it's those times when you're sitting around a table and you're not spaced apart, and of course you don't have a mask on because you're eating and drinking. Um, those are the times that virus will take off. And um, we know it only too well. Uh, I'm not making anything up here that's novel. So my advice to people is to really follow the guidance that we came out with on Friday um, and that everybody's quite aware of at this point in time. One last quick question, uh, schools. Uh, would it be a good idea if schools were to go to all remote after Thanksgiving and just uh, you know, take, uh, take those last four months and not do in person or? or... Well, well, part of the guidance we gave everybody uh, even before Friday was about travel. And the fact is uh, for anyone who wants to travel, they need to come back and quarantine no matter where they go, there's nowhere safe. Uh, and that's a Vermonter leaving and coming back. Plus, if Vermonters want to have out-of-state company, those people have to go through a quarantine. They can't just arrive and sit down at the table and uh, give hugs to everybody. Um, that's not going to work. So having said that, we should not have to close schools if everybody's abided by all of this because they won't be putting anybody at risk. If they do travel, uh, they need to not attend school, then schools might be at risk of having to close only because they don't have sufficient staff to, to run the school. Um, but otherwise, they should be able to have in-person education still. We are prioritizing the in-person education, especially of our younger students and the child cares. Those are critical to our society right now and to the uh, emotional and developmental growth of our kids. And uh, we really want to keep those intact. So that's what my message would be regarding schools. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Levine, I, I, I know you've got another call or meeting to go to. So thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate hearing from you. And uh, well, uh, it'll be interesting to talk when this is all over and, and sort of analyze whatever happened here. <laughs> But anyway, thanks again. I really appreciate you uh, being uh, on our program today and, uh, and reminding us all of what's needed to be done, particularly at, at this juncture. Thank you very much as well, and stay safe, everybody.